Stop playing. <laughs> I know it's okay. tempting. Good morning. Um, thank, thank you for those of you who were in my first session. Uh, was it a good session? Thumbs up? Yeah, okay. Okay, cool. Good. It's good to start with a good presentation and, and go from there. So what's interesting is I have met so many fabulous people in this community that have devoted their lives to making sure that conferences like this exist. And the gentleman who just walked out of here, Stephen, is one of the people, the main person putting on this conference. But Cindy here is the person that originated beside San Antonio. I, yeah. So Wait. let's give her. <laughs> Woo! Thank you. Who paid for a lot of that? Okay, no heckling. Wow. No heckling. Wow. So what I what, what I have seen within the community is that so many people go above and beyond their work and their lives and their family lives and then get on nine o'clock phone calls every six weeks to do an all-hands meeting to put on B-Sides Las Vegas or put on all of these conferences late at night. But what I've understood is also that people are learning very basic technical skills and non-technical skills that are actually helping them in their day job. It is actually helping them throughout their career. So Cindy and I and a few others put together this presentation sort of going over what we have learned and what we wish we had not learned volunteering within the community and sort of giving you a roadmap for that. I've also developed a survey that I'm going to be putting out later this afternoon asking people to sort of fill out why they volunteer in the community and what they have learned from that. So look for that later. So who we have? Cindy and myself. Cindy, you want to tell everyone a little bit about you, other than that you're part of DEF CON and DERMACON? Yeah, and I've got a, I do a lot of stuff. Um, my name is Cindy Jones. I'm currently working with Rapid7 as a principal security consultant. And basically what that means is that I go out to organizations and evaluate security programs or perform program development to help them improve the maturity of their security programs. Um, I've been in IT forever. Um, I have a six-digit Microsoft certification number. It starts with a three. I just confirmed that last night. That was kind of scary. Um, but I originally was a psych major, and a lot of what I do and how I what I bring to the table is the want to help people. Um, that's still kind of the core of my being, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But yeah, this is me. I live in, I've lived in San Antonio for 10 years now. Kathleen already mentioned I kicked this sucker off after being harassed incessantly by that man over there So um, to do it. But it's worked out pretty good, and I'm really, really proud of what Steven has done with this thing. This yeah. is, I, I gave it up three years ago, and it's still growing, and I think it's awesome. But thank you guys for supporting it and coming out and making Beside San Antonio as awesome as it is. So <laughs> thanks to you all as well. But that's me. So those of you who are in my earlier presentation, my name is Kathleen Smith. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for two companies, one, clearjobs.net, which is a job board and job fair company in the security clear community, and CyberSec Jobs USA, uh, also a job board and job fair company within the cybersecurity community. If you have any of the wristbands, I think I saw Cindy I was wearing one. one. Uh, we provide all of the wristbands to all of the cons out there to start the conversations mm -hmm. because we realize that career conversations happen face-to-face -face rather than just online. I've been volunteering in the community, this community, for about eight years now. Someone told me it was 10, but I don't want to go there. <laughs> and I've been doing overall volunteering within various different communities, the recruiting community, the military community, for the last 17, 18 years. So I might do something, know a little bit about volunteering. So Cindy, why volunteer? So one of the things I already talked about a little bit was the my want to help people, make things better for whatever the case may be. Um, I started off attending DEF CON, I think it was 13 was my first one. It was still at Alexis Park. Um, I got a lot out of it. I mean, I got a lot out of it. I was also very, I'm not going to say antisocial, but I was very timid. Um, which, if you know me now, is so totally not me. But that's a whole different story. We'll talk about that. I have a 3 p.m. talk, by the way, if you want to hear about that story. Anyways, <laughs> um, so I went and I got a lot out of it. Um, B-Side started. Got a lot out of that. It was kind of amazing. Uh, 
realized that I wanted to give back a little bit and start things, just start contributing and giving back and doing what I, my base, my core of my being says that I'm good at and that's helping other people and getting things moving forward and bringing some satisfaction to myself and doing positive things. So that's why I started volunteering. Some of the reasons why I started volunteering is that at the core of my job is business development. And I would get out into the community, in the security clear community, there's the Armed Forces Communications and Electronics Association, FCA, or there are other organizations out there, and I had to do it to network and get business development opportunities. I soon realized that I really hated doing that. That was not <laughs> something that was me. Uh, and when you're a blonde woman in the government contracting field, you're one of 10 women that are in the Washington, D.C. area, and it's just a very uncomfortable feeling. Uh, it's also, I'm much better at marketing and event management, and I learned that when I was at many of these groups. I just sort of said, I'm not good at biz dev. I cannot put together a sales contract for the, you know, the life of me. I just don't want to do it. So that was what was really great for me as far as volunteering is I went into it with one aspect, but then I learned something else. But what we want to go into a little bit more further is what volunteering opportunities, how do you evaluate them? How do you figure out, okay, put it this way. How did you originally evaluate it and how do you evaluate it now? So originally I thought it was B-Sides, right? It was B-Sides Austin actually. Um, I had been at B-Sides Las Vegas, the second one. Or, I'm sorry, the first one, no, it was the second one, I apologize. Um, and it was, really cool. I mean, the vibe was cool. It was laid back. It was interactive. People could talk to each other. It wasn't like there were speakers being hustled down the hallways in the back of the hotel or anything like that. People were actually approachable and you could, you could have conversations and dig further into the, uh, the topics at hand. So that to me was amazing. Um, found out about B-Sides Austin, which was also the second one. It was at the uh, yeah, fire we, marshal. We were one of the first five yeah. total B-sides. Yeah, first so it was, was 40 people the fire marshal is when yeah. we had the fire marshal building. That so was that the first was, one I ran. Yeah. yeah, so that was South by Southwest time up in Austin. And I walked in there, I got there early, and I'm like, can I help? And that's how it started. There wasn't a lot of thought into how I was going to make the determination. Question, question on that. Did you guys ever consider as a part of this volunteering that you were enhancing your resume? We'll get we're, into we're that. We'll get into that. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's the point. And we just helped uh, Pat Russell for a B-side down to the valley. We had our point. Heard about that. That's oh, awesome. Yeah. Super excited about that. Yeah, that's, that's really neat. Cool. So, how you evaluate opportunities yeah. now and, and how do you evaluate opportunities now versus how you so, evaluate in the beginning? In the beginning, in the beginning, um, I didn't evaluate. I said, oh, you want me, you need help? I'll help. Oh, you want me to help? Oh, yeah, please. You know, you just asked me to help. I'll, I'm there for you. I, there was no evaluation. It was like, okay, yes, I'll do this. And I just worked myself and worked myself and worked myself. Now, um, I try to pick and choose what I work on. Um, I was very pleased to be able to successfully hand off this, this event. Um, Steven, like I said before, super proud of what he's done. He's ran with it. Every year there's something, something new and something different and something more, which is awesome. Um, and he was equally as nervous as we were when we first started. Oh, yeah. He was. Oh, yeah. We, <laughs> so all, we, we all, I mean, it's, it's a... Timid still occurs here. Yeah, it's, oh, it's a stressful scenario to put one of these things on. But, um, yeah, so now I, I, I try to be a little bit more circumspect in my decision making. Most recently, the last thing I was asked to be involved with was DEF CON China, which was kind of awesome. I got to go to China. For DEF CON China, this is amazing, right? We had our first DEF CON in China. Mind blowing. And it was absolutely not your daddy's DEF CON. It was completely different, but that's a whole different scenario. But it was still an amazing experience, and I was asked to go there. So, yes, that absolutely was going to happen. It, uh, I'm very fortunate in the fact that I have support from various arenas in my world that uh, allow me to do this on a routine basis. So, it really is a matter of determining what I'm able to contribute to an organization, so these are my criteria. What can I contribute by volunteering? What can I get out of it? Because I have come to the realization that I can't do something for nothing all the time. Mm -hmm. There's gotta be. 
something coming back. And, and that's, that's a big part of the evaluation. So when I started volunteering about 17, 18 years ago, if anyone asked me, I said yes. They're like, oh, you know, you seem to be really good at structuring a con. You seem to be really good at getting the marketing out there. And I had a very patient boss and a very patient family at that time when they realized that I was gone 90% of the time because I was either working or I was volunteering in the afternoon. Yeah. And I wasn't looking at what I was getting back for me and I wasn't looking at what I was getting back for my overall company because I sort of run into this, I'm in marketing, but I'm also in volunteering. What am I going to get back? And is it something that is worth the investment of the company? So a lot of us are in that stage where we say, oh, I want to be part of this, and I want to be part of this, and I want to be part of this. And before you know it, you're not saying no to anybody, and you're stressed out, and you're not doing good work across the board. So now when I evaluate something, like I actually have a conference call this afternoon at the airport to talk about someone, talk with someone who's starting up a new nonprofit or a new con, and I have some criteria. What, what kind of work have you already done? What kind of references do you have? What is, what is your thinking process of doing this conference? I can't tell you how many times someone will email me or reach out to me on social media. Hey, I want to put on a conference for kids in cybersecurity in October. I'm like, yeah, you and everybody else. Um, you know, have you ever put on an event before? Well, no, I think it's a really good idea. There's a big difference between someone who has a really big idea and someone who knows how to put on an event. So really, when you're starting to look at these volunteer opportunities, really look at how they're going to use your skills. How are you going to be able to make an impact? There are many times when I have done an impact and I realized that I carried 90% of the event, but somebody else was taking the credit for that. And I'm sick and tired of that. So now people know that if there is a conference being put on, I'm doing it. So what's interesting, and we're going to get into this too, you know, this is the whole reason why we have this cock, is what are some of the skills? So let's talk about spreading ourselves thin. What career skill has you learned between saying no and saying yes to some of the conferences? So taking the Wayback Machine again, um, running B-Sides San Antonio the first year, I uh, had a lot of support from other B-Sides, uh, specifically Austin Michael is a huge help calling up constantly, dude, what do I do for this? What do I do for this? What do I do for this? Um, he made recommendations across the board nine times out of 10 and went with them. Then I found some new things as I continued to grow. But I took it all on myself. I am a horrible delegator. I have come to realize this. And that in itself, I think, is a skill. I realize this is a fault of mine and I have to work around this, right? Uh, attempted for three years, I did this pretty much on my own. Um, <coughs> Not the way to do it. I see Steven working with groups and people and I got pictures of them stuffing bags together and it was all me for so long. And I didn't know how to delegate out things. So I realized that was a skill I really needed to learn. So I started teaching myself that. Something else I started doing was losing some of that, I talked about being timid and not going out and doing anything. Um, learning, I, I, 10 years ago, standing in front of a group even this size, no way. There's just no way I would speak to a group like this. Now I'm standing in front of boards. I'm standing in front of, I presented in front of Air Force you know, chiefs of staff in the past. I um, have no problem speaking to people and speaking my mind and being confident in doing so. This is something else that I've gained out of, the, out of doing the volunteer work and, and knowing that I put on a pretty good show. I could do okay here. This is good. I'm good here. Mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily a subject matter expert, but these are some of the things that I've learned. It's got, I've gained some confidence. Um, and knowing that eventually, like the skills that I don't have, I can learn and I move forward with them. Mm -hmm. So delegation is a really big thing that you learn when you're volunteering. And delegating is something that you definitely want to learn as you're becoming more of a manager in your career right. or even if you're managing a team understanding what delegating means it doesn't mean here's this thing that i used to do go do it it means you have to give specific outlines of this is the goal of that activity these are the things you're going to want to think back these are the details that you want to follow and realize success. that you know and this is what success looks like right. and then also understanding that they're not going to do it the exact same way that you've done it and you have to be okay with that you have to be okay with it <laughs> because you're going to drive your co-volunteers and your employees nuts if you're following 
always looking over their shoulder. I have a staff of 17 now, and what's really interesting is they really dread it whenever I walk into the room because they know I'm gonna say, well, I would have done it this way and I would have done that way. This is something that I've learned to keep my mouth shut in volunteering when you delegate. You have to let people do it their way and you have to let them fail. Those are the things you have to get comfortable with rather than going, oh my God, they failed, and, and then you blast them all over social media and then you have a beer and then you've ruined a relationship. We all learn differently. So we're gonna go a little bit more into other career skills, but let's talk a little bit more about conference management and some of the things that you have learned. You know, you've talked a little bit about how you've you know, grown from besides Austin helping you, besides San Antonio, DEF CON, but also looking at um, some of the different skills like financial management, going after sponsorship, and then also let's talk about how you've engaged your employer because conference management really isn't, you know, about leaving your day job. No. It's about doing it and your day job. So <laughs> yeah. what, are your, what are the other skills in conference management you've learned if someone here is considering going into conference management and how did you engage your employer? So I've covered the gamut as far as employers go. Um, initially, when I was doing, the first year I did besides San Antonio, I was working on an Air Force contract. You get, I think you get 10 days a year PTO, period. They don't care anything above and beyond that, they're not gonna care. Um, you go in the red, you hope that your contract carries over so your last paycheck doesn't get cut in half, and that's just how it works. Um, there was no desire for these companies, they were out of the DC area, they didn't know anything about First of all, nine times out of ten, they weren't information security, so they didn't know anything about a B-Sides event. They certainly weren't going to sponsor. I did try, but it never happened. And so I would go in the red. I would lose vacation time. Um, and it, that's not just in organizing the conferences. So that's attending conferences as well. And I mean, as a lot of you guys know me, I'm at a lot of cons. I, I enjoy going to conferences and learning and talking to people and absorbing as much as I can. So from an employer standpoint, in the beginning, it was rough. It was very rough flip that completely on its ear, I work for Rapid7 now. Rapid7 is very prominent in the information security industry. We sponsor, I don't know why we're not sponsoring here, but I'm not gonna talk about that. Um, but we sponsor- This is being recorded. Okay, hi guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, so I mean, we sponsor so many different conferences and they encourage us to go to these things. They want us to be seen as representatives not only of the organization, but as, you know, they want us to be the leaders in the community. They want a community presence. One of the things that's great about Rapid7 is Metasploit, right, and the Metasploit project and the framework that's available to the world, right? This is available to the world. So by all means, yes, we are community leaders. Let's keep dri driving forward on this. Um, um, excuse me, gentlemen, you're, you're blocking oh, that. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so, um, so like I said, I flipped the end because of this. They give me and mo a lot of our employees pretty free reign to go ahead and join in on conferences, speak at conferences. They support us in the organization aspect of it. So that we actually have billing codes so they can track our time and see how much time we're putting into it during during the work week. I mean. It's more, it's, and there's no repercussions if we're spending more time doing this than something else, as long as our day job's getting done, mm -hmm. right? But it is above and beyond our day job. I still have 40 hours a week I have to bill, whether it's to internal projects or to client work. So there's that to think of. 80 hour work weeks, freaking exhausting. <laughs> Let's face it, nobody wants to do this, but sometimes it's necessary to get the job done if your job is to go ahead and organize this conference. So how, uh, talking to your employer, you know, before, you, you have to make that decision if you're going to get involved with a con, if you're going to tell your employer or not. And if you're not going to tell your employer, how are you going to still get your day job done, your wash done, the groceries done, and everything that you've promised to the con that you're going to get done? Yeah. At some point, if you really enjoy doing all of the conference management, you might want to start talking to your employer about what you're doing. One of the ways to do that is to explain to them the different career skills that you're learning. One of the career skills that you're learning that we talked about earlier is delegation. Mm -hmm. If you're learning how to delegate, oh great, this happens every single time. Um, <laughs> it, it isn't a presentation with you unless I have my bit defender come up. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Explaining to your employer that you're learning other skills. This is not playtime. Yeah. 
that these are other skills that you're learning. Yeah. Delegation is really one. Learning new projects. Time management. Yeah, time management. I mean, <laughs> all of us, I mean, there's a whole industry out there to teach us how to manage our time. If you're able to do your job, get the groceries and the laundry done, and still support the con, yeah. you're really becoming better of a time manager. And most of your supervisors are gonna love that because half the time they're running after you making sure that you're trying to do the different projects on time. The other thing is, in a con management, you also have to think about sponsorships. You have to get out and sell something. Getting out and making that case. Well, that kind of communication and presentation skills you're going to want to have in your career as you go and talk to other clients, as mm -hmm. you talk to customers. As Cindy said, she you know, goes and talks to chief of staff and Air Force colonels. Being able to get out there and talk about something that you're passionate about. We're not all passionate about pen testing, but if you're passionate about putting on a B-side, you can learn those presentation skills. And also finance management. It's interesting when yeah. we're at work, oh, I'm just gonna order 100 pencils, you know, the company's gonna pay for it, they don't manage. When you're running a con and you say, okay, are we going to get enough bags? Are we gonna get enough t-shirts? If we use this vendor versus that vendor, if we put three logos on versus two logos, that all of a sudden, managing all of that, you know, yeah, maybe we know how to balance our checkbook, but managing something that is for the community that other people are relying about, you're yeah. all of a sudden gaining this fiduciary responsibility, a really big word, fiduciary responsibility, understanding that you are responsible for the finances of another organization. Right. And these are things that you need to be talking about with your employer, even if it's at the end of the con, you go back and they say, how was it? You know, hey, it was a great con. No, Should've I managed. been there. You should have been there, she <laughs> sponsored. No, you should say, I managed a team of 10, I brought in sponsorship, I'm, I co-managed several projects at the same time, and I still got my work done. So being able to remind yourself that you need to keep journals of the volunteering, what you learned, what kind of skills, and say, you know, I really enjoyed the finance aspect of this. Maybe we might want to consider this in my career within this company. Then I, I, I look at different parts of the company, maybe finance. But it's we're, really funny, though, because when every time I would have, you know, you, you're, you're, for a B-Sides event, typically, your budget, the, the nominal fee that gets charged it's just to make sure you guys show up and the, the event doesn't lose money on t-shirts. That's literally all that money is for. It doesn't pay for anything, okay? The money, the bulk of the money for besides event comes in from sponsorships. For whatever reason, apparently I'm really good at the budgeting aspect and I had no idea that I was. I was coming in like within two to three hundred dollars every year. And it just, it just fell into place. I can spend this as, and, and, and I am not a project management person. I don't do project plans very well. It's all in here. So the fact that I was able to do that year after year and know that, okay, I can go ahead and order these speaker gifts because I can afford them this year was awesome. And it was like, wow, I have a skill I didn't even know I had. That was another thing that I realized. And I was like, hey, I can do budgets. No problem. Mm -hmm. But be sure, I put it on paper. You know, <laughs> so this is something that you talk about. You may not necessarily want to put it on your resume as something that says, you know, you know, managed budget. But you might want to bring it in as something that you talk about during the interview. Say, so, you know, not Absolutely. only do I do really, you know, I'm a really great SOC analyst, but I also have some financial wherewithal. I, I understand some delegation. And what's interesting is people also want to see it in your social media profiles. Definitely be, you know, tagging whatever con that you're working at on your LinkedIn profile. Being sure that you're listing on the LinkedIn profile was conference manager for three years running and write what you did. Right that you were a manager, right that you secured sponsorships. It shows that you're more of a well-rounded individual. It also says that you're out in the community or you have initiative, program managing, all of these other additional skills that employers are going to be looking for. And they, they are really starting to look for them now. So let's sort of, oh, comp they, no, competitions, that's me. That's you. That's me, okay. So those of you who were in our, my earlier presentation, I'm sorry, this is a repeat, but when you go and are interviewing for a job, 
a lot of times those of us will say, uh, the employer will come back and say, do you have the experience? And you say, well, no, I have the education and I have a, cert a certificate, but I don't necessarily have the experience. I find it very interesting that people compete in competitions and they don't realize that that is very similar to work experience. So you're given a challenge, you're given a short amount of time, you're working with new people and you have a deadline and it's all in a stressful environment. If that isn't work experience, I don't know what is. But a lot of people sit there and say, well, I've competed in 20 or 30 different competitions, but I don't have any work experience. You should be listing your competitions on your resume. You should be listing them on your LinkedIn profile. On our job board, you actually can list it in your profile all the various different competitions that you've been part of. But also do yourself the favor that when you come back from doing the competition, write out what you did in the competition. What was the challenge? What was the flag? What were the steps that you had to go through? What did you fail in? What lesson did you learn? Now that you've gone through the technical, what are the non-technical things? Did you become the leader or did you end up following someone else? Did you learn that you have certain communication challenges? Did you learn that you, know, you were trying to solve a problem and somebody else, like, wait a minute, we're just, we're just speaking words here, we're not communicating. That you learned something about your non-technical skills. I always say to people that even if they're not part of the competition, hanging around and, and observing and learning by osmosis is really great. But also going to competitions that are outside of your technical skill set. There's cyber policy competitions. There's hacking, you know, car hacking village. There's Wi-Fi villages. Being sure that you're constantly learning by exposing yourself Absolutely. to the various different competitions. And guess what? What, hap what, what are the other entities that are at competitions. Other people who are in this community. Yeah. It is a way to expand your network. And when you know that the number one way an employer finds their new uh, employees is through employee referral, the more people you have in your network, the more people that you've connected with and you have sort of vetted them and they have said, yeah, you know, I really liked working with this person at a competition when we weren't paid and I could do what I wanted, I might actually like working with them, you know, day in, day out. And that's how you start building your network outside of the people that you hang out with or the people that you go to school with or something like that. Competitions are really great for that. And definitely, as I said, talk to your employer, you know, I just did this competition or when you're going through your review, when they talk about, you know, where you want to go, you could say, I was in this competition, I learned this, I would like to start building my career more in that direction. So really use the competitions as a way to gain experience, but also gain experience that you can talk about in an interview or on your resume. So, so comment on that? Yeah. So one of the challenges I've had with some interviews and people that have done competitions is they cannot articulate because they like doing the attacking competitions. Right. But eighty percent of the jobs or more are routine. Sorry to tell you that, that's the reality. <laughs> Articulating that I love to do these attack competitions does not get translated in interviews or your resume or some summary. That's something people need to improve. Right. To say, I learned how to attack Linux, that means I can tell you how to do defend or detection of logging would light up me like a Christmas tree. I, I, people struggle with the fact that do that, they don't understand that it has to translate right. to real today work that you might be doing. It does. Right. And, and on the flip side of that, I mean, I know, for example, we're, our pen test team is hiring people who have been in competitions. That's what they're looking at. They're looking for, I'm going to say something now, please don't take it the wrong, fresh meat that are, that's, that are just really passionate and that are competing in these competitions and they're doing well. They might be failing, but they're learning in the process, mm -hmm. right? And we actually have a job role that's specifically geared towards that kind of a person, brand new out of school, just you know, getting out there doing competitions, um, you know, and then we talk about things like CCDC, right? You know, and there's so much focus in 100 those. Hundred percent employment. Yeah, yeah, guaranteed. You win. Oh my gosh, you're you're well, you're in the finals. You're going to have interviews, right? You know, so so in competitions don't have to be at cons. There are tons of competitions that are online, mm -hmm. uh, so you can definitely be building your skill set with that. As I said in my earlier presentations, you also want to make sure that you have your own home lab that you can talk about during your interviews. What are the open source projects that you're working on? But a lot of times you'll learn about these by going to different conferences. So now, presentations. 
That's that's underestimated what you just said there. Okay. You're working on a side project, got nothing to do with conferences or planning or anything else, to show me you know blue team or write some detection response, and you're you've got some project on GitHub, something you coded, something you wrote. I mean, good guy the question. Uh, explain some a problem you tried to solve and how you did it. <laughs> Everybody, right? Everyone. right? <laughs> That's what they're asking you for, okay? If you can do something that shows you're not an eight to fiver, even though part of this could be done at eight to five, but something above and special, outside the con stuff, totally um, true. That is huge employment benefit for somebody. Totally like true. Yeah, and and I think that that's we focus. Yes, education and yes, certifications are important in this industry, especially if you're going into government contracting and you, you need get to do the yeah the, the 8570 <laughs> and the yeah. 8140. But realize that your desire to continuously learn, your desire to go out and be part of competitions, those are things that you want to, you know, be putting on your resume. But as Michael said, being able to also explain it to non-technical people. Uh, it's a challenge that a lot of people don't understand. So sit ar sitting around with the people you competed with after you've high-fived and had a beer or something like that, you know, do a debrief, do a hot wash. How, how would we explain this to our bosses at home? Help each other yeah. explain that rather than just going home and, and being excited. So true. presentations, a lot of people think that presentations are easy to do Slide decks are really great and easy to do, that employers love when you go out to conferences, and that it's, again, so easy to stand up in front of a group of strangers. So tell us a little bit about presenting, what you've went through, and... So the hardest part of any presentation for me is standing up and telling you my name. I don't know what it is. I've been talking public, speaking, sorry, talking publicly, wow. Speaking publicly for a long time now. It started off the first time somebody put a microphone in my hand. I think it was at a B-Sides Austin event, and I was calling numbers. I'm like, wait, I have power. This is amazing. Did <laughs> um, you do it up my daughter when she did it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's weird. It's weird how it happens. It's just a thing. I don't know. And I think it only happens to certain personality types. But like I said before, very timid. Never would have gotten up in front of people. Never would have had a had the gumption to think that I could have anything worth to say to anyone like this. You know, just let me be in my little cave here. Um, I hacked my brain. I did a really good job. I have no problem standing in front of people now. I still get nervous. It still stresses me out. But I, I hacked my brain to the point where I can not only be, you know, approachable, but also approach it, be approach, approaching. I don't know how I would say that to individuals on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but I can also do it in front of a group of people. How has this helped my career? It, it is my career. That's my job now. I walk into organizations and I talk to groups of people and I drill them on their security programs. Like, okay, what do you have for this? And I'm not an auditor, I want them to tell me things. So that's another side. I was a psych major, so I'm really good at getting people to tell me things, even probably more things than I wanna know. But I can get them, to, you know, getting people to speak to me and so I have that capability within myself, and I've always had that there. Building that out, taking that information, and then taking what they've told me, translating it, and then presenting to a group of a C suite and giving a presentation there. That's more stressful for me than standing in a room like this right now and telling mm -hmm. my story, right? Sitting there, unless I'm like at eye level and it's a peer to peer thing, really stressful for me. But it, how has it helped my career? It, it's made my career. So, we all have technical abilities, but being able to explain them to non-technical people is really an amazing skill, and it's it one is. that you have to work on over and over and over again. I mean, I've been presenting for close to 25 years, and it's only within the last 10 years that I've actually gotten comfortable and being able to stand up most and, and be able to speak from you know whatever aspect. But also being able to under, get people to understand what I'm saying. My words may not be what you hear. So going to a presentation and actually putting the material in a format so that the audience can understand is a skill that you need to work on, but it is something that, as Cindy said, trying to explain technical to non-technical people is a very desirable skill, especially in this industry. And one of the best ways to do that is by presenting at the conferences because mm -hmm. you have people in the audience that say, you explained how to do this attack vector. 
I know what you were saying because I've worked with you, but I don't think anyone else in right. the room helped you. So getting that feedback from the, com from the community and being willing to accept it. People are not criticizing. 99% of the people that I know in this community, when they give you feedback, they are trying to help you. But doing a presentation at a conference is not, as I said earlier, is not because you have 20,000 uh, Twitter followers and that you know how to wear cool t-shirts. It is the fact that you have to think about the thought, you have to come up with an outline, you then have to, for most of the conferences, you have to submit at the call for proposals. Now, for most of the conferences, the call for the proposals is six to eight months before the conference is put on. So time management, knowing when, okay, I want to speak at B-Side San Antonio or B-Side Austin or B-Side San Francisco next year or something like that. You have to have the detail management to go to that conference website on a regular basis and start to see when their call for proposals is open. And then you have to know how to fill out the survey that is the call for proposals. There is not one generic form. I sure wish there was. It would be but great. The, it would be great, but there isn't. So it can be everything from a Google survey, which is very easy to fill out, or if you send in a submission to the Grace Hopper Conference, which is a great conference, but it is an eight-section <laughs> proposal process to go through and they will ding you if you do not dot your I's and cross your T's. You may have the best presentation out there, but if you do not follow their format, you're out of there. But it is a really great exercise on filling it through. Most of the conferences, if they reject you, they will at least tell you why they rejected you. My Grace Hopper proposal was because they said I didn't fill everything out and I wanted to appeal that, but no, what, they don't. Are we also not? Diverse enough? We were not diverse enough. No. We, were only, like that. we were only in security. No, was, no, was, was no, that? no. It was just no, diversity? Was, yeah, anyway, yeah. We're not, different, different topic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <sighs> I we took were, her there. We were very <laughs> bummed about that. Yeah, we were really so <laughs> um, Anyway, because we said we had diverse thought. We weren't diverse. Anyway, yeah. um, it's also then time management. Being able to go and say, that you know, I'm, I filled out the proposal, I followed the timeline, I put together a presentation anywhere from 15 minutes all the way up to two hours. But then you have this other hurdle to go over, which is do you say if you're representing your company or not? Now, this is something that you, un you well, I, shh, let me finish, okay? <laughs> you started to. So you have to understand, you know, if you work like at Rapid7, they're going to love and support the fact that you are out there presenting. Absolutely. And they will may or may not help you with putting together your presentation or not. They'll provide support. Absolutely. They'll provide support. Yeah. They will work with your management as far as having the time off to go do it and to come back. There are some employers who are not going to be so forgiving. So you know, you'll notice that most of the B-sides are on Saturdays, so you can still come in and you know, go under another avatar or under a name and, and not say that you're representing your company. There are some companies who will say, you need to go through our own internal approval process to be able to present at a conference. Realize that internal process is another six months on top of the whole thing. So first of all, you have to know that you want to present at RSA next um, April. You'll have to know that the deadline for the CFP is sometime in December. You'll have to then know that you are taking, you know, it will take six months to get the approval process throughout your company to be able to get it done. And once it's approved, some companies, I'm working with one for higher ground, there are only approved images that the company will allow you to use. So you have to understand, I'm, I'm really having fun with this financial institution that doesn't have an approved vis uh, image of a hacker, but anyway, it's really funny. <laughs> I think after all these years, there's not an approved image. Anyway, Just take a picture but of at the end back. of the day, it's another way of giving back. If con management is not something for you, or if competitions is not something for you, but you do have a, a widget that you built or a solution that you put together and you really want to share that with the community, really consider putting together a proposal. You might find out, like the first time I stood up to present and it unfortunately was in front of 3,000 people and I had 15 minutes to uh, prepare, 
I realized that I liked to present. Uh, <laughs> I was actually good at it. Being the eldest of five girls does help that. Uh, but, or you might like, I'm, I'm about ready to throw up and I'm never gonna do this again. But it's, those are the things that we learn about each other and ourselves. We oh. keep doing that. Oh, yeah. So, in our final eight minutes, you've heard us say we've said yes a lot, we've had a lot of frustration, we've had a lot of burnout. Yes, volunteering is extremely draining. It is. It is also extremely rewarding. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So, a lot of this is career development, right? <laughs> career development and career growth through volunteerism. Um, the job I have now <clears throat> was because I was involved in the community involvement that I have. Um, they pay for me to do a lot of these conferences. They send me to, you know, Derby. They send me to DEF CON. They send me to, you know, B-Sides where I'm an organizer in, in Vegas. They support me whether I'm presenting, organizing, volunteering, sometimes just attending. Who knew? You can attend the conference. Um, <laughs> so they're very supportive in that regard. It's kind of a dream scenario for me in, this, in that regard. I've also interviewed for multiple other jobs. Um, didn't work out for one, way, one reason or another, but that was all through contacts <clears throat> excuse me, that I made networking and doing this volunteer work. I never, I'm horrible with names, so if I don't remember, if I've met you before and I don't remember your name, thank you, so thirsty. Um, I'm horrible with names, but it's always dude, because I remember faces and I remember conversations that we've had. So I've managed to go ahead and build my network out on a, a, the dude level across, you know, nationally, which is really awesome. Um, and one of the advantages of being a female in InfoSec, there's not a lot of us, so most of us are pretty memorable. They tend to remember our names, thank goodness. Because, like I said, that's a problem I have to work on, but I don't know if it's ever going to happen. But because of that, I've interviewed at other companies. Um, I interviewed for SpaceX, with SpaceX, got all the way up to Elon Musk's desk, you know, at which point it didn't happen, which was soul crushing to me, but that happened through my networking. Um, never would have known these people without doing the volunteer work that I do. You know, this is, it's just the way it is. It is a huge entry into very various aspects of the industry. And, but realize that you also have you have a job, you have a family, yep. you, as I said, you have groceries and you have laundry to do. Um, my husband hates it when August rolls around because he knows that I will be stressed out for the six months ahead of it and then I will be sleeping for the two weeks afterwards <laughs> because I will be in Vegas for eight days doing a two-day conference, producing, presenting, and I'm presenting three other times as well. But I love it. Um, right I've been it. in you know, various different communities. I'm a military spouse. I actually associate the military, tight, the military community tightness that they'll watch your back with the hacker community. I know they'll watch my back. Yeah. But me being an introvert uh, and being you know, from marketing, never thought that the InfoSec tech community would accept me, but I think they have at this yeah, point. Yeah, I love you. Yeah, kind of love me. <laughs> uh, but how do you explain this to your employer? So what's interesting, or in your career search, so what's interesting is um, you know, I think if Cindy went and interviewed to somebody and said, I do DerbyCon, I do DEF CON, I do this, what the recruiter or the employer is going to hear is that this person is going to be out of the office all the time. You have to be careful how yeah. you manage that with a recruiter or your employer because they're like, well, why, why am I having you here to do a job? Now, if you can explain the job similar Time to wake up. <laughs> here, here. Um, you have to be sort of careful about how you explain this to a recruiter that you know you're not going to be out of the office all the time. Yeah. You need to build the trust and your reputation with your employer as saying, okay, these are the things I'm going to do. Now, if they're on my own time or they're on the weekend, hey, that's your own time. But if it's going to take some of your work time, you need to start building that you know, trust and relationship Absolutely. with your supervisor. And also be a little careful when you do list it on your resume or on your LinkedIn profile that you're not listing like every single thing you do. You might want to just, you know, if it's... Especially if you're an overachiever like me and just want to... Yeah, I mean, you know... Don't. 
You can come I, up in conversation, trust me. <laughs> I mean, I'm on nine planning committees, uh, nine B-Sides planning committees, and including B-Sides Las Vegas. I'm also on three other committees for women in cybersecurity conferences and my own nonprofit, Recruit DC. If I went to another employer, they would say, am I ever going to get any work out of you? My employer knows that this is part of my work and I always make sure that there is some kind of return on investment mm -hmm. for my employer. There's a return on the investment for Rapid7 with Cindy because she is a walking commercial for board. how great it is to work there. <laughs> so kind of you have board. to learn how to negotiate that. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people who don't let anyone know in, the, in their work environment or a recruiter know how much they do in the community. But as I said in my earlier presentation, if you start building relationships with recruiters who are in the community and keep in touch with them when you need to find a job, they've seen you being in the community. They know you're technically, avail uh, technically talented. They know that you're connected in the network. They know that you can manage many different things. Anyone who I've seen in the, in the con community that has started and moved their way, their way up, this has mirrored their career. Yeah. All of the skills that they learn in the nonprofit, excuse me, in the volunteering world translate in one way or another within their career. One thing that um, I really learned is that I take something that I'm going to experiment with in my professional work, I work on it in the volunteering and community efforts. So, for instance, I run a chef program for farmers markets in Washington, D.C. And any time that I wanted to, yeah, <laughs> in my spare time, um, any time I wanted to play with a new marketing program or a new graphic program or a new social media program, I played with it over there because it was my time and my money or it was mostly free. And I got to learn on my own time. And I learned, I was able to compare various different programs. So then when my employer came along and said, you know, we need a new social media management company, I actually was able to say, I evaluated these five different programs, and these are the two that I think work the, well, work the best. And I think that this one, given what I know that we need to do for our work, this one is going to work out best. I've already done all the research. I've done self-education. But my employer was like, wow, you just saved us, you know, six months of evaluating right. and going through an RFP. So you have sort of this playground. Now realize you're playing with much more valuable resources in the volunteer con community than you are with your employer. But it is a really great way to go back and forth. If there's something great that you work on within your, your employer and you know that you can deploy it within the community, that happens all the time yeah. with besides Las Vegas is that, hey, we all work with this, that, or the other, and we think it would be really yeah, great. We've here. got a Cisco or Aruba. We've got Aruba, Aruba Networks. Networks now coming into besides Las Vegas. They said they gave us all this gear, which is amazing. Well, we now have a guy who's on staff who's an Aruba genius because that's what he does for a living. That's awesome. So we've got this going. I mean, there are so many opportunities out there for volunteerism and for to become involved to then expand your network and expand your potential as far as from an employment perspective, it's mind boggling. It really is. It surprised the heck out of me, honestly. Mm -hmm. When I first got into it, I was like, I was just doing this for me. But it worked out pretty well. <laughs> I'm, pretty good. I'm pretty happy with the way it worked out. We have one minute for questions. Anyone has any questions? No, you've talked too much. Let's talk to him. Yes. <laughs> um, I guess this is for you, Cindy. I was wondering, yeah. um, so you said you're like a psychology I was a psych major, yeah. So, like, at what point, um, or how did you end up getting into this, <laughs> and at what point? That was kind of a, it, that's kind of a, it, I was taking an abnormal psych class. I was doing a paper on violent criminals and empathy. And I was profiling four violent criminals, and it scared the daylights out of me. Um, left that, said, you know, maybe I need to rethink where I want to go with my career. Ended up getting a temp job. Fell into IT. No rhyme, no reason. I ended up at a temp job taking due to data entry, and I fell into IT because of that. They found a position for me because I was bored to tears, and the IT to security thing just evolved. The psychology training that I did have has proven priceless. I mean, it's been so, I've been, I'm so grateful I have it because it does help me with communication skills. Um, getting, what I was talking about, getting that, you know, getting information out of my clients. Um, that there was never a, there was no moment, it just kind of evolved that way. 
and I'm forever grateful that it did because computers make a lot more sense than human minds, let me tell you. <laughs> so you got your IT job, um, fell into it, and then from there, I'm assuming you just kind of like networked out. Yeah, I ended up um, getting, the company that I was working for ended up going under and I had a choice of doing a novel, this is like dating me well, and I'll be talking about this a little bit more in my talk later, but uh, I had a choice of a novel or a Microsoft cert class, they were doing retraining because there was so many people laid off at once. I took Microsoft and ran with that, and then it was just kind of an evolution. I started doing um, support, desktop engineering, network engineering, um, systems administration work, and that's kind of evolved into security from there. So it was, a, it, was a, it was a long haul. Security was never the focus initially, but it's kind of exactly where I belong. It was a niche that just fit perfectly once I finally got there. I think I know where he's going with this, because oh. none of us, a lot of uh, the elders, the senior people, there was no IT classes for the most part. Yeah, security so, was a... There were no security classes. <laughs> no security. So Didn't we kind of grew up with the industry. That's gotcha. probably how we really got into it more than going to San Luis Computer Science. Yeah. yeah. Now you guys have a choice. We really... Yeah, the industry exists. So I'm getting, I'm getting the hook. Yeah. Um, I have to kick you guys out so you can go find your other sessions. Um, my third and final session for the morning is we have three recruiters who are going to come up here and we're going to ask them a variety of questions that they recommend as far as career search. Let's thank Cindy for being my thank panelist. You. Thank you. Wow, that hurts. Thank yes. you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, also, if you want to, uh, also